Hey, everybody. Josh Kovac, Pro Principal at Memorial Pathway Academy in Garland ISD, Garland, USA. Start me up on the flagship show tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern, getting ready to make sure that we get stronger together with our awesome guests, our authors, our speakers, wherever it might be. Because you know what? This is a time when we get all together under one banner. So under the lock middle, under the lock middle banner, making sure that we're united, sharpening our tools, and it doesn't matter where you're at. And we have an awesome guest. This is part two. Part, part two, two. Of him back because you know what? He had so much to offer, sharpening all those tools, giving us all that knowledge that we needed a part two for him. So it doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're Alaska, whether you're Hawaii, whether you're Maine, or you are in Florida, or anywhere in the 48. We're here stronger together. Part of the Fantastic Four with Chica, with Coach Hurd, with Principal Cafele, and Ross Gaskins learning from each other. What do you think about that, Dean? I don't know what else is left to say there, Principal Tova, Dean Packer, Principal Charlton Middle School in Charlton, Massachusetts. And it's Sunday night. And like Josh said, it's all about getting a little bit better each and every time we come on the air. So, again, you know, we've had so many great shows on. And, and tonight we're coming into the sequel, part number two. Um, and I'm telling you what. You know, the first time we had uh, John on, it was absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you, we had, I went through his book, and I'll tell you what, it just flew. I mean, it went, it went by really quickly, but it had a great flow to the conversation. And again, you can tell the passion, desire, and everything behind everything that he does. So even before we bring him on, Josh, anything new with you? Anything going on down in the world of Texas? You know, we're good. That's a hey, separate but, nation, isn't it? I, I I know that you're part of the 50 states. Exactly. We, we tolerate all 49 of you. Principal Ooh. Cafele, thank you for joining us. You know that, that here in... The Lone Star State, we allow the other 49 to be part of our little <laughs> sphere of influence here. But, you know, it's been a great week. And we were there with Kevin Curtis at his conference with Principal Cafele, learning on another set of tools, SEL. So it's been a great thing for myself, always making sure that I become a better version of myself. Because you know what? That creates a ripple effect. The more that I learn, the more that I could provide um, encouragement to all our team members, and especially our Jaguars. We, I took a set of three team members. We drove down there to the conference back home for the, for two days. Kevin Curtis, kudos to you. Principal Cafele, great job out there. All of the presenters did a phenomenal job because you know what? That's what we're all in about. We're all educators, lifelong learners, making sure that we become a better version of ourselves. So, Dean, I enjoy that. Hopefully, a couple more conferences down the road. You know what? They're a little bit dry mm -hmm. still. I don't know if you've been out there, but they're still a little, little bit dry. But you know what? It's becoming, it's coming, it's turning over a little bit I, more. I need to get better at that, Josh. And I love that you're going out and you, you're you making yourself visible. You're learning. You're opening up your, your, your lens, your learning lens, and you're trying to bring back all the great things to your school. And I'll tell you, you administrators out there, if you're new to the game, get out there, network, listen, build that toolbox, that leadership toolbox. There are so many people that want to help out and just provide stuff to you. Great nuggets. And I'll tell you what, none of us, None of us have created everything on our own. This is about beg, borrowing, and stealing and applying it to what is best for kids and your staff. And if you think about it that way, guess what? Systems begin to grow. Speaking about systems, why don't you do the honor of bringing our guest in tonight, my friend? You know what? Um, this young man is just on fire. He just drops knowledge to where I had to check out the broadcast again the last time that he was on, making sure that you know I was able to grasp because... John speaks it from his heart. Not only that, but he role models what is out there. He tells us that the reality is there, that engaging the kids, making sure that we use appropriate assessments of kids, especially after these last two years of nonsense, we have to rewire us, adults, have to rewire how we see education assessments, because you know what? We all know that the country's report card came back not good. We all know statewide, our, our states, our report cards came back not good. So as adults, we need to make sure we use different tools to make sure that our kids are successful and use that assessment. But you know what? I am not the guru. I am not the professional. <laughs> this guy right here, this guy right here, John, that guy, that guy knows what it's all about. John, welcome to Unlock the Middle, the flagship show here on Sunday. I love being on the flagship. Ooh, it just gives you chills. It's like you could warm your hands around the flagship. And uh, I totally agree, guys. Like it just so it's just so we're going to be talking about assessment this time. So here's a couple of quick thoughts for you guys. Number one, I saw in the news about three weeks ago, 
scores are dramatically down, right? Scores are dramatically down because of COVID. And then, you know what? I'm a good reader, so I read the rest of the article. The scores are down 8%. It should have been down 40%. You know what that tells me? That tells me all the tiger moms kept teaching their tiger kids. And it tells me that the kids that didn't pass before COVID aren't passing after COVID. The scores should have been down 40 or 50 points. They were down eight. Uh, Statistical deviation wise, it's not an official statistical deviation until 10 points. So that's my first thought. Here's my second thought for anybody that hasn't hung out with me before. I went back to class full time during COVID 2019-20. I fired myself from administration. I said, I'm going to be in this career for 10 more years. I need to know exactly what works and exactly how this is working. My scores went from 9% to 41%, and I did no tests. Hmm. Maybe we're doing this wrong, guys. And you know what, John? I think that it's one of those things, too, where it starts with our chair as administrators to make sure that we remind everybody, especially with a brand new influx of new educators that are not certified, that we tell them, hey, we don't have to live by the 1980 factory style model. You don't need to do that. There's other ways of assessing kids. There's so Mm -hmm. many different ways, but the thing is, how can we do it real quick when right now we're in the middle of of, of the turmoil of the school year? Well, hold on. Before yeah. John, John, before you say that, John, just give yeah. the audience a little bit of your background. I apologize. I know part one, you came out there with that, but just a little bit about who you are, because I'll tell you what, we know you, but I want them to know exactly where you're coming from. So uh, let's see, got married to this cute girl in 1991 and she made me become a teacher. Uh, turns out that uh, I have a latent ability to teach that nobody knew about. Uh, I did a little D1 coaching, so I knew the general vibe. Uh, spent the next 20 years working my way from 4-8 teacher to opening a high school from scratch to principal to d- director to county office to county assistant soup. And then if for y'all from Texas, if you know what Mass, uh, sorry, uh, TCEA is, and if you're in uh, Massachusetts, you know what Mass Q is. I was the executive director of Q, which is roughly th- 30,000 educators. And I said, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to talk to boards all day. I don't want to, I don't want to do the marketing all the time. I like both of those, but I don't want to do this full time. I want to work with teachers. So we had written this uh, book, uh, Edge Protocols, uh, the Edge Protocol Field Guide. We have sold almost 40,000, which just blows my mind as a formerly B minus uh, language arts student. <laughs> um and it's, it's not a biography, it's a kind of a cookbook, like how to teach better. And so for the last, uh, coming up just about on two years, I've been doing that full time now. I've been in, I don't know if you guys follow this on social media, I've been in 107 classrooms this year since wow. September, doing demonstration lessons, taking over. I come in, I take over the class. You guys, I had 126 graders in my class. I had a hundred second graders and the way that I teach, I call it like stadium style teaching. I feel like a Bono when I come off, you know, I got my crazy glasses and I'm sweaty, but um, what I'm modeling for teachers is that school can be fast tempo, engaging for everybody and effective. And my favorite part is after those lessons with a hundred kids is uh, the grading's done. We're ready to go. So and teachers just aren't used to what that looks like. So it's really, really fun to get out and do that. So there's a quick synopsis of, of my of my thing. So you touched all the bases, man, and you've actually risen to the top of where you're at right now by clearing through all those hurdles. So nice job. And I think you've had yeah. a lot of different viewpoints from what education should be like. Now, to Josh's question, when he first started off in assessment, you know, we're coming out of post-COVID time period right now. You can't just go back to what you were doing. You've got to take the best of all the world oh, yeah. that you had to bring together and now create a new learning opportunity for kids. And assessment right. needs to change and be adjustable as well. So, Josh, just just to just to go back to that question that you asked, John, just kind of um, throw back out there again. I just think that right now, what are we doing as administrators in different parts of the country to make sure that we support our brand new team members that are either 
We're still hiring them right now. They're alternative certification. They didn't take the the pathway of high school, college teacher. They're coming out of different mentalities, different ways of um, seeing education. So how can we make sure that they, these new team members, don't yeah. go back to what they're used to in high school? Well, yeah, and it's even it's even worse than that because they're codependent on what they did in college. And trust me, I've got friends that teach at the university level that are cool cats. But what I'm seeing in general from college is this aspiration towards the ivory tower. If I only had a better lecture and if these kids would only do their flashcards, everything would be fine. And Moe B is right. You can have fun doing the basics it's totally possible and i agree with you moe i'm going to meet the class where they are i'm going to let i'm going to meet them where they are i'm not going to come in and pine away about oh you know it's too bad that the last year's teachers didn't teach them math facts well then that's that's my problem and think about like a football coach or a volleyball coach you can't bemoan what happened last year you can't complain about the people on your team uh because your future is tied to getting those people to perform at the highest possible level. So you can't start off by saying, oh, these people, they don't know anything. That is not how we do it. So I think that's really critical is meeting your kids where they are and then growing them as much as you can. And since you guys are administrators, I think you'll love this quote from Teddy Roosevelt Jr., um, at D-Day, the, the Allies had trained for three years to go nine miles. I want you to think about this. 150,000 adult men trained for three years to go nine miles and land on a beach. Dean, they landed on the wrong beach. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And Teddy Roosevelt said, well, I guess we'll start the war right here. He didn't get upset. He didn't say, get back in the boats. We're going to go two miles. He didn't start blaming people. He just, man, he was living in the moment. This is where we are. We're going to start right here. And I think, I think teachers would do well to have more of that kind of a mindset. You know, I 100% agree with you there. And when I'm thinking about, you know, how, you know, student engagement is everything. Without student engagement, you don't have learning. And that assessment that we have will, it will allow us to gauge what kids are learning. So, what are some of the tactics that you have found to be successful in kind of helping educators understand that the assessment whole, the whole assessment wheel has to change. Talk about that for a second. What, what have you, what have you done to help that? Like when you go in those classrooms, how do you get them to drink that Kool-Aid and begin to change? Um, well, the first thing is we, you, we are used to starting our class like this. Oh, all these kids don't know anything. So it's going to take us three weeks. I'm going to tell you guys exactly how I did it with my sixth graders a couple years ago. We're doing early man. If you're teaching sixth grade social studies, the least exciting unit is early man because you're waiting to do Egypt <laughs> and Greece and Rome. And those are a lot sexier. Amen, Sean Moriarty. Yeah, those are not everybody's super excited about early man. So here's what I did, you guys, using the Edge of Protocols mindset. I went out on Look It and Quizzes and GimKit, and I found about a 45-question quiz that covered what I felt like was the vast majority of the material. AFAR Triangle, Lucy, Dr. Leakey, uh, the Rift Valley, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Australopithecines. I, I, got, I got, did like an all-inclusive, and I said, hey, you guys, take this Look It. And they got in there, and they started digging and at the end, they had got like 14% right. And I said, no worries. We're going to do that again in five minutes. Let me show you some of the things that you just heard for the first time. Coached them up a little bit. Boom, we went right back in. Now we're like at 27%, which is not great, but it's twice as good as 11. About, And then we did a couple of other edge protocols. We did some iron chefing and we did some cyber sandwiching. We read some articles. We did some summaries. We did some other things. About three days later, we play the big quiz again. Boom, we're at 45%. We keep that going. We do uh, uh, some more articles. We go re read chapter four. We do this. We do some mapping activities. We come back. We do the activity. The bottom line is, you guys, in the same five weeks, 
that I would have slowly dribbled out all that information. I basically just dumped it on their head. And uh, after about four and a half weeks, boom, 94% on the 45 question quiz. Okay. Plus, and Sean will give me a woot woot on this. The uh, we did a, a solo Iron Chef, which means basically each kid did a five slide report in one hour on their own. Everybody but like maybe three got an A and I'm done and I'm done. And this this is an environment that's really good for changing kids perspective of what teaching and learning is because they're used to getting worse every day. They're not used to getting better every day. And the reps and the feedback totally change all of that. You know, as, as we discuss this right now with the assessments like you brought up, and we're used to the bubble world. Texas is starting to change the bubble world with their mm -hmm. um, EOC star test. But still, I would infer Massachusetts and other states still love the bubbling. So why yeah. is the bubbling of such a fallacy? Why is it problematic? Well, I think the problem with bubble tests is you can pass a bubble test, but you're not getting any of what I would like to call like meta skills. So I can get A's and B's on bubble tests from just skimming the material, but that doesn't mean I know how to cite a source. And it doesn't mean I know how to summarize. And it doesn't know, mean that I know how to build something from scratch. And I think going back to when I was like a freshman or a sophomore in high school, I remember very clearly going home in my parents' car one night when I was a freshman or sophomore thinking, Mike, I have no idea how to do taxes. And this is back in 1979 when it was 10 times easier, right? And so I think uh, bubble tests can work at the university level. Bubble tests can work for some things. But when you deal with fourth and fifth and sixth graders, them guessing on bubble tests is not going to give you a student who can actually make things. And I think when kids cannot make things, I think that is really, they, they can't articulate why it's a problem, but they're very aware that they have a weakness. And like Sean says, uh, bubble testing is rote memorization. If I want to do rote memorization, I'll do a game kit or a book it, you guys. Everybody has a good time. Everybody's going to pass and we wrap it out. If I want kids to know the content, we're going to do things like somebody wanted but so then, and we're going to do things like a thick slide, and we're going to do things where the student have to actually make things. Uh, one last thought on that, too. I read Anthony Bourdain's book, uh, Kitchen Confidential. Uh, I read it in the bathroom because I bought it for my wife, but she wasn't reading it, so I just started reading like, you know, three pages at a time. And, uh, I hit this one section where he talked about mise en place. Do you guys know what mise en place is? No. It's French, and it means all the little pieces. And here's the best way I can explain it. The reason everybody doesn't make all their own fresh salsa is because it's a giant pain to slice up all the veggies. I will happily pay $3 to not have to clean out my grinder and chop up all the veggies, right? And it, just like in a moment, Josh, this just flew into my mind. I thought, oh, my God, I've always thought I was the chef, and I'm not. I'm the sous chef. My job is to chop up the pieces for the kids and let them assemble it. And here's why. They can assemble much more sophisticated things if I have pre-sliced them. And they can do it faster, which means they will by a secondary order will not hate doing the work. If they can do it faster and they don't hate it, we can do more work. And then eventually the scaffold comes away and they are the chefs. And that is like, that's the easiest way I can explain the question. We're not trying to raise kids who can just make French fries. That would be the bubble test. Fries are in, wait three minutes, dump them out. Don't screw up the salt, right? The only really cool thing is you get the McDonald's, like that super scooper thing. That's awesome. I want one of those. But you're not really a cook if you're making French fries. A cook has to consider timing. A cook has to consider sources. A cook has to consider the order of operations. The cook has to think about the client and all these different things. And so that's, I think that that, and a cook analogy, bubble tests are French fries, right? Bubble tests are French fries. 
And then being able to run a food truck is what I want our students and teachers to be like. I'm still stuck on reps and sets because if you go into the gym and work out your body, you want your body to get better, bigger, better, stronger. What are you going to do? Reps and sets. Reps, so reps. That is just, I, I just, you teachers out there, yeah. listen to what he's saying. This is good stuff right here. Hey, let's take a look at tests over and over again. Okay. Um, the value, the value. Okay. Content is important no matter what. If we devalue on a test and kids fail and we don't allow them to take that again, we're essentially saying, this doesn't matter. Let's just move on to the next thing. Let's create a gap in learning. But to or do that, if we just say you can fail and do it again, I'm devaluing it because now you're not going to worry about it ahead of time. Talk so about that. I, build upon it. I'm in this middle ground that says we're going to rep this sucker till everybody gets an A, which is, again, much more like a coaching mindset. But I'm going to add a little bit more to it now, Dean, because you guys go. are coming on. You're coming on board with me. What kind of sports team am I going to have if we only practice offense for the next three weeks? We're going to win any games. We're going to win any games. Nope. So then I panic. Now I teach just defense for three weeks. Are we going to win any games? Nope. Nope. Then I think, oh, my God, we need to do just special teams. And then I do just special teams for three weeks. And that's what we tend to do in school. We do one thing at a time. We're going to do three weeks on ancient Rome, and then for one week, we'll do a report. We're going to do four weeks on ancient Greece, and then for three days, we'll do a report. So in the protocols mindset, it's how do I do every part of the game every day? I do some memorizing every day, like um, Sean was talking about. Fast and curious, seven minutes a day. I do some summarizing every day, cyber sandwich, iron chef, number mania. Every day, I'm hitting all the skills. And the reason teachers don't think they can do that is because they think, and let's be honest right now, because I went back to the classroom, dude, I'm just about dead from prepping. And you're telling me to prep three things a day instead of one. But here's the key. You're going to use the same thing over and over again. Teachers are absolutely gobsmacked when I tell them you can use the same gym kit all four days this week on Visigoths or on a, pa a periodic table. But that's just one part of my class practice. So if I'm going to use it again tomorrow, what's my prep, you guys? Nothing. And if it scores it for me, what's my grading time? Nothing. And then tomorrow we'll do an Iron Chef, which is the same activity my kids did last week, but with new content. So they're getting better at the activity. And then Wednesday we do a Cyber Sound, which was the same thing we did last week, except we're getting better. So I'm not explaining things all the time. In fact, uh, this one just for you, Moe. I had my kids in February. I said, here's the assignment. Go. And they sat there and they looked at their Google Classroom. They looked at me. They looked at their Google Classroom. And they go, it's, 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 it's not in the Google Classroom. And I said, it is February. Your mother does not work here. Make your own slides. Ready? Go. And they went, okay. But they knew what the assignment was. And if you've ever coached a sports team, you know that in the finals, you can look at little 11-year-old Josh and go, you got him man-to-man? -man? And Josh will go, I do not. I do not got him man-to-man. -man. I need zone. And he is able to assess what he needs to win the game. Does that make sense? Yeah, you create and, entry points. And there, Absolutely. And, yeah. And so when you're doing bubble tests all the time, you never get there because all you do is say, listen, it's going to be on the bubble test. Listen, it's going to be on the bubble test. Listen, it's going to be on the bubble test. And then every kid in the, on the planet thinks they're Spicoli. They think they're just going to cruise the class and get a B on the final. You're not going to get a B on the final. You haven't done anything. Well, you lit a fire into learning on kids for kids. If you think about it, that's that's really cool that you say that because you're creating entry paths for them at their place, and that right. doesn't happen. That doesn't happen often in a lot of classrooms. You're absolutely yeah. correct. That's, and uh, true that's story true. in in classrooms that I've been visiting, I've had no less than four sped aides crying, weeping, and these are the adults that go with a sped student from class to class to class, and they're there. What do you need? I'm here to help. And I've looked over and I see the sped teacher going like this. And I'm like, oh, are you okay? What's happening? What happened? <laughs> and they go, this kid never does anything. He just came in third. How'd you do that? <laughs> How did you do that? <sighs> and, and I told him, I just switched from listening-based learning to learning-based learning. Like, let's just get in there. And guess what? A lot of our kids that are uh, either don't do any work 
or are on the spectrum or maybe Asperger's, those kids are big time gamers. All yeah. I got to do is tap into that. You go into any IEP and ask the kid how they feel about Minecraft. They'll be like, oh, I got a YouTube channel. I'm good. You look at the teacher. Do you want to do some Minecraft? Usually the teacher's like, I have no idea what Minecraft is. So wait a minute. Ooh, is is the kid uh, academically inept? Or are we playing a game that's just kind of reserved for adults? It's very tricky. And, and um, I think that that's the loop that we're in in public education. Mm -hmm. We hope that after uh, we came out of this nonsense, this disease the last couple of years, we will restructure it, but it looks like we're heading back to that. Now, one of the oh, yeah. one of the things that um oh I'm sorry Spicoli Fast Times at Richmond High. <laughs> look it also up. California ish. Uh, 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 all you youngins don't understand what he just said. Look it up. Great movie. <laughs> you might need to fast forward a couple of scenes. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. But other than that, um, you know one of the one of the flaws that uh, even as administrators that we do and it trickles down to our, our team members in the classroom is about providing feedback. So when we do walkthroughs, sometimes we don't provide the mm -hmm. feedback for whatever reason. Life happens, we go to the next classroom, we don't do it. But that also, that creates an issue in regards to the student. Sometimes we issue out a, a paragraph, multi, uh, uh, whatever assessment that we have, and we don't tell the kids because we have to grade every period. And so we don't give them back their grades or, and we don't make any notes till, oh, I got to go to the party. I'll grade it. Yep. The weekend. So yep. I have literally it? watched, I've watched a teacher doing eighth grade grades during graduation. Like kids are literally going across the stage and he's mad dogging it in the back of the building. And I'm like, bro, what are you doing? My grades were locked down a week ago, you know? And, but again, it's, it's the kind of malformed idea that I'm going to, I'm gonna make. I'm just gonna make kids work all class, and then I'm gonna end up with this huge stack of papers. Middle school and high school teachers, right? This huge stack of papers, and then now I'm gonna take those papers at the end of the day when I feel like I've been beat with a rubber hose because teaching is a hard physical job, and then I look at that stack of stack of papers and I go, mm, maybe tomorrow, and then boom, it's on. It is on. So what we do is called uh, T W M. Uh, T let's see, let's see, T W A teaching. <laughs> teach uh, teach while walking around. So I'm going to walk around the room giving kids real time feedback. And today I'm only going to grade participation points. Fill up the paper, get five points, and then I'm going to make a note of things they were bad at. And now I've got to read Moe's comment because she's on fire. If you stand on your head and recite the alphabet then that is what you do. Meet them where they are. Yeah, exactly. Make those connections. So um, back to where I was going, though, with this is lots of lots. OK, one more thing, you guys, you have teachers in your buildings that struggle with this. I got a kid that doesn't do anything. Yeah. And what I learned from teaching high school is if you don't uh, address that the first day of school, that kid is going home every night and telling mom and dad that he doesn't help me and this class is too hard and he just says Google it. And by the time I meet with mom and dad at, at uh, first parent quarter, first quarter parent meetings, they have a wheelbarrow of anger to dump out on me. So here's how I do it now. First day. Hey, mom, all he needed to do was play Blook it today, did nothing. All he needed to do was make one slide and he did nothing. All he needed to do was write a paragraph, and he did nothing. Catch me up on what this looks like. I'm not going to make any accusations, okay? But I'm going to find out. And I'll tell you guys, 85% of the time, the mom is like, oh, he is a dead man. <laughs> that Xbox is going away. Let me get him. And so those kids know that I'm serious about school right away. With the kids that don't, I literally had a parent last year. This parent worked in our cafeteria, and I couldn't track her down. She worked on site and I couldn't get her to meet with me. So I just said, and you'll love this, Josh. That's me, Hermano, right there. That's in Loco Parentis, Dean. That is my guy. And I got it now. He is my problem to motivate, engage, and understand as a person. That is my, if the parents aren't responsive, I'm going to get there. And it takes time. But that Charlie. guy right there, that guy that, that I just talked about, he went from first percentile to 54th in math with me. Charlie. 
John, let me do a, a sidebar for a second here. When yeah. you're looking at schools in general and what you do now is you go around and you do this and you and you work uh, with them, how do you get a whole school to change a mindset on assessment? Because oh, what that's you're easy. doing, go ahead, go ahead, talk about that for a second because that's huge. You don't, you don't. Oh, okay, <laughs> um, all right. You know, what you, tests it, are 50%, quizzes are 40, and it's 10% homework. What, I got it. Exactly. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to have a lead guard of teachers start the process. And when they start telling their neighbors, hey, if you do it the way that I'm doing it, your scores will be up 30 or 40 points, your behavior issues are down, and you'll go home on time, then, then the other teachers come on board. Humans are naturally skeptical. And you cannot make a, adult humans do anything. I just think about it this way. If I said everybody that's listening right now, free Starbucks, I'll bet you only half of them would even sign up. Because some are saying, I don't do caffeine. Some are saying, I don't do corporate coffee. Some are doing like, well, I'm more of a, I'm more of a you know, tea person. And uh, Starbucks tea is not that good. Uh, it's just, you, you're not going to get 100%. Yeah. And a lot of times as administrators, we have a little Soviet guy in the back of our head and we're thinking, I will demand everybody do this. It doesn't work like that. Compliance it just never works. doesn't. It, it doesn't. doesn't. Like the Russians. The it's not going to work from our seat either. Stalin killed 20 million people and they still wouldn't listen to him. What you've got to do is present something that looks more attractive. That's what moves you forward. Yeah. And Sean's right. They'll say, oh, it's just one more initiative. What we're talking about is a way that you can make your teaching better for the rest of your career, no matter what initiatives come out. But that's going to take people a while to come on board. Like, there's still people that haven't had te Texas brisket. Am I wrong, Josh? There's still people that have not had Texas brisket. Yeah, but those of us that have had it are like, oh, that's a huge mistake, bro. But somebody like Dean has got to go, let's go try it. I heard it's good. And that's just not where people naturally are. They're just not naturally there. There's uh, still John, people that haven't had sushi. Yeah. Blend in the grade book for me, will you? Just talk about the grade book. Why is okay. the grade book need to begin to change? So, uh, and I, I think I sent this to you guys in the notes. The, the grade book is not a postmortem. The grade book is a garden. What happens if you don't weed the garden, Dean? Well, it overtakes everything. Yeah, the grade book is really a science experiment. Watch this, you guys. I send an assignment out, only 50% get done. It's a science experiment. They may not be rejecting me. It may be they're not capable of doing the assignment. Now I've got to get my gear on here. I've got to be thinking about, okay, was it too long? Was it too hard? Is it too early in the year? How can I change that outcome? Everything in the grade book is stimulus response the way I run it. In a college class, they do this. Here's the syllabus. Turn in the papers. If you don't, you're effed. Well, we're dealing with adults. We're dealing with adults. Fourth graders are not adults. So what I do in the grade book is I do things and I see how the students respond. Simple. Do things. And if the students, uh, now I used to do homework. If I did a, a homework assignment and uh, only 50% got turned in, part of that's me. Part of that's me. And, and maybe we didn't practice enough, but we sent it home. Maybe it was too hard. I've got to take in part of that. In, in college, you can just say, oh, 50% didn't do it. That's fine. They can drop. They drop. These are not fourth graders. These are not fifth graders. These people are under 18. Yeah, Moe, I love it. Look for trends and adjust. It's that simple. Now, here's the second piece of what I do in my classroom. I have, have you guys ever heard of a marketing? Say so again? Marketing, marketing funnel. A marketing marketing funnel. funnel. Okay, a marketing funnel says if I put out a million views during the Super Bowl, it should funnel down a thousand people purchasing. It's a fairly simple concept. The more people that see it, it's kind of like Josh when you were dating. If I ask 30 girls out, one might say yes. It's the same kind of idea. So <laughs> that's the dating funnel. So you do all of these things and you might get some positive results. Like if Josh only asked one girl to the prom, he may not be going to the prom. He may need to ask five girls. 
So you got to get the volume up. If you, uh, he says more. So for me, for me, I call it the the cone of failure because the first day, Monday, it may be that three quarters of my class fails, but we're going to do it again tomorrow. Now only 40% of my class fails, and we're going to do it again Wednesday. Now only 20% of my class fails. So I am very comfortable with a bad Monday result as long as, and these are the key words, everybody works. So if we do a GIM kit right now, we're a book it right now, as long as everybody answers 25 questions, boom. Here we go. That's an A for today for effort. Tomorrow. If you answer at least 25 questions, it's an A for the day for effort. Guess what happens by Thursday, Friday? The kids are like, hey, Crippo, look at this. <laughs> I got a 90%. I'm just tricking them in to my upside down marketing funnel. Now, let's compare that with a lot of classrooms. And Sheka's right. I'm sure Josh had too many girlfriends. That was probably the bigger <laughs> problem. Um, the... The idea here is no different than a football practice or a volleyball practice. Do we expect everybody to run the play perfectly on Monday? No. And if they don't, do we blame them and freak out? No. We say tomorrow, we're going to work on your footwork. We're going to get that. And I wish Sean could jump in with this. Yeah. And just, oh, yeah. let's just Sean's read this guy. quote. With the reps, kids know they're going to struggle on Monday, but we'll be killing it at the end of the day. You guys, I have tweets from teachers that literally say this. You guys are going to get destroyed today, but I will get you there by Thursday. Ha <laughs> ha. Like they're flexing on the kids and the kids are like, come at me, bro. Let's do this. They don't expect, you know, you don't buy Call of Duty and play the whole first game in one try. That game would suck. You get in there because you want a challenge and you want a problem to solve. And I got to listen to a, a Stanford researcher and she talked about four kinds of fun and I forgot three. Here's the only kind of fun I care about at school. Hard fun. Kids don't come to school for fun fun. They don't want to do acrostic poems. They don't respect you. Okay. They don't want to do dot to dots. They don't respect you. They want an actual challenge that they can actually get better at. And I've never seen kids light up except like I will go on these classroom demos and I just grab the principal and I'm like, you're going to play the whole class right now. And they're like, but I haven't studied. They haven't studied either. Let's go. And uh, yeah, and Mo Moe's right, productive struggle. I also like the word grapple. Grapple, because to me, grapple means that we're kind of, oh, urgh, I'm struggling with it. I haven't got a handle on it. And then boom, I got it pinned. And that's the way I want kids to work in class because ga guess what, you guys? That's SEL. That's mental toughness. That's the ability to say, I don't know how to do this, but my kid, my friend over there two deaths away might have an idea. Let's go. That is real life. That's my take. I mean, we can almost stop the show right here, man. You've killed everything that we've talked about, but we don't have to. I got a couple more things we have to get through. Let's talk about developing meta meta skills. What does that mean? Yeah. Let's, let's okay. dig into that a little bit. So, again, from my visits, you guys, I've been in dozens of K three classrooms. Watch this. I go into the classroom and I type type in tinyworld.com slash vv measuring. And they go like this. It's like they don't know there are keys on the keyboard, you guys. Isn't letter and number recognition a standard? Isn't that a pretty big deal in K3? If you can't actually type the numbers and letters to get where you want on the Internet, how disabled are you? If you're in fourth grade and I say write a paragraph and you still don't know how to put the capitals at the beginning and a ending mark, how disabled are you? If you're in seventh grade and you can't do three digit multiplication, how disabled are you? So I think a lot of times where I'm going with this is a lot of times teachers think if we do standard 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, these kids will have learned a lot. If they can't write a paragraph, they've got nothing. If they can't read an article and summarize it, they've got nothing. They, they just have a stack of weird standards, and they don't hook them to anything. So for me, it's really important that you, you're running really two stories in your class, which is, like I was saying earlier, 
Um, if we're studying early man, they need to know who Dr. Lewis Leakey and his wife were. If we're studying early man, they need to understand the difference between an Australopithecine and a Cro-Magnon. Those are the standards. <laughs> but I've also got to be teaching them how to research things and how to summarize things and how to write sentences and paragraphs. There's two tracks. And we tend to think, just teach the standards and everything will be fine. And this is how you get fifth graders who can't write a paragraph. And so the meta skill is, can I be productive with something? Can I make something out of it? And when you see, um, one last quick story, and then I'll shut up on this. Uh, when I went back to sixth grade, I had a bunch of kids that were fairly good writers. Like if I said, write a story about blah, it was pretty good. It wasn't bad. If I said, let's uh, paraphrase something, oh my God, they were on the floor. It was like I was killing them. Ah, paraphrasing! Or they didn't say anything and they just copy-pasted it all. Now, that is a, not a good place to be if you're on the cusp of middle school. That is a very bad place. So that would be the meta skill involved with being able to be ready for middle school. It's important to know the, the periodic table or the constitution or that stuff. But if you cannot read an article and paraphrase five facts from it, you are in deep trouble. And they're aware of that, but they can't articulate it. And so what happens is that manifests itself as boredom and frustration. Hey, John, you know what? In closing right now, um, we're all preparing for those state exams. The state of Texas... Mm -hmm is doing Pass. we're doing retesters with the current eoc which is a graduation exam for high schoolers mm -hmm. in december and then the state of texas restructured the entire oh. five exams the entire systemic approach to taking the exam for april and may so these kids have been domestic. So well, let me get this straight. The kids have been playing softball all year. You're going to take them to a baseball game? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. So they, they Or even worse, yet, they've been playing kickball, and you're <laughs> going to take them to a baseball game. And then they're going to yell at us that we're bad teachers because the scores are down. Well, welcome to the Lone Star State. But it is what it is. I'm just presenting to you what yeah. the current situation is yeah. in Texas. So what can you tell? Not on the Texas situation that I presented yeah. to you. Okay. But what can so, you say about doing effectively? Let me, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Teachers will constantly tell you that they don't have time to do things, but then we will sometimes watch Finding Nemo for the last two weeks of school. Oh. Mm. Sometimes. sometimes. I'm not pointing fingers at everybody. No. Yep. But they're, okay, so here's what I did about 1999. Technically, last century, Moe. <laughs> Technically, uh, I looked at my language arts book in California and I said, where is irony? And irony was on like page 378. And I said, wow, that's going to be like if we get to it. <laughs> yeah, last millennium. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so if we get to it, it'll be like a week before the state test. And think about it. In math, where do we put geometry and measurement two weeks before the state test? You know the two easiest ways to raise math scores? Measurement and geometry. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find out how bad it is. I'm going to look at the state assessment, and I'm going to try to simulate that workload all year. Um, Dean, football team. Oh, well, we only, we're only going to play three-quarter games this year, but when we get to the championship, the other team plays four-quarter games. How's that going to go? Not well. It's going to be bad. Coaches will overtrain for the event, but teachers think that kids are not super intelligent based on the way the kids behave in their class because they're bored. So what I do is I figure out ways to – I want to get over the rainbow as fast and as far as I can. Does that make sense, Josh? So what I would do, in your setting is I would get the hands on those practice materials. Hopefully you get practice materials. And I'm going to, I'm going to take my Thurston Howell pinky up and I'm going to put it down. That's a Gilligan's Island reference. I'm going to put my super fancy swanky finger up. I'm going to take that down and I'm going to go, this is the challenge at hand. And I'm going to reformat my classroom to feel like that. Now, in California, Josh, they came out with these things called IABs. 
which are like, they're like formative quizzes for the end of the year test in California, provided by the state. You know what teachers did? A, totally ignored it. I'm too busy. B, totally ignored it. I need training. And C, hid from them. Now, what happens to my kids when they see the test for the first time and there's a calculator in there and we've not used a calculator all year? It's like being a 1AA football team walking in on a 6AA game. Dude, it's not the same. It is a lot faster. And what's this artificial turf all about? We play on dirt at my place. So my big, big meta thing for people is find out how bad it's going to be and rep the crap out of that format, whatever it's going to be. And you you know, this is what the Tiger Moms do with SAT, right? Here's the SAT. We're going to take it 14 times. I'm just going to use the Tiger Mom mentality. And that's not teaching to the test if I'm doing the work in the same spirit. So for example, in California, it says sixth graders will know the common literary devices the textbook gives me onomatopoeia, alliteration, and foreshadowing. There's 33 other literary devices, but the publishers leave them out. I got to be a professional. I'm going to teach my kids all 36 literary devices. How do kids? How do they? How are they becoming good readers without knowing what irony is? How are you going to be a good reader if you don't know what poetic justice is? How are you going to be a good reader if you don't know what a subplot or a metaphor are? So you got to teach all 30. And then you got to rep it until the kids live it so that when they hit the state test, it goes like this. What's a good metaphor in this uh, 16th century haiku? And they go, I got this, but I got to start the year there. I got to start. I can't do like boring packets, boring packets, and then test prep for the last three weeks because that's what another group of teachers would do. They'll try to slap in a bunch of stuff at the last minute and, and there's no depth of knowledge there. It's just cram and dump. So. How's that? Is that pretty good? Uh, John, I'm, I'm just going to say changing a mindset is never easy. It's never easy. You got to be willing yeah. to step out of your comfort zone, let go of the things that you think are important to you and look at the things that are important to kids and growth. And I'll yeah. tell you, I mean, I love it from a coaching standpoint, uh, reps, yeah. stats, hitting all these things. Like if you've got to really play the big school in the big game and they have a six, seven receiver, you got to find a way to simulate that, right? Absolutely. You Absolutely. can't see that for the first time in the game. And Moe, to your point, listen to this. This is just for this is for <laughs> this is for Sean if he's still here. When I got my first Scantron machine last millennium, you know what I did, you guys? I gave the kids Scantrons. I gave them a whole Scantron, and I went like this: Number one is A. And I said, "You're not you're not filling it in. Number one is A. Number two is B. Number three is C." And they're like, "Where's the test?" I go, "Just fill them in." And I gave them. 50 questions. And then I ran them through the Scantron right in front of them. They missed an average of eight. And I gave them the questions. So to Moe's point, you got it. The, the format has to be done without thinking. Now in California, the Common Core test, the calculator, all the functions are reversed for some reason from a normal calculator. So I'm going to practice that way. And if they ask questions, oh, here's another great example, you guys. Classically, the textbook will have us do what? We're going to read a story about a boy who was lost in a jungle. It's going to be five-day story, one page a day, popcorn reading. Am I doing pretty good? We might have a little handout every day. And then on Friday, there's a test with seven questions. In California, what they're going to get is they're going to get seven stories in four genres in one sitting. It's like going to the Super Bowl without having played a down all year. So guess what I do in my class, you guys? We routinely read four or five stories in one hour. I make it a little shorter, so it's only maybe four paragraphs, but we're hitting four genres and four types of questions one hour. And I've literally had students, when we get to the state test, they go like this, hey, only 65 questions. This is cool. That's not how most kids respond to the state test. But like you said, Dean, it's tempo, it's format, Moe, all the stuff you're saying is right. If you roll kids in, they're going to emotionally shut down, which is going to make their score two to three times worse than their cognitive ability. Well, John, you're building capacity. 
Think about that yeah. for a second. That's all yeah. you're doing every doing. single day. And what you're doing from multi different lenses, you're building that capacity and you're I'll offering you, opportunity. The number one way we're not going to lose is because my kids can't handle the amount of work. Well, we may not know all the standards, but we're not going to freak out over seeing 40 questions for the first time all year. But you cultivated that from day one. That became a norm. That became yeah. a norm. Because again, I'm looking at the end of the bridge. Where do I need to be in May? If that's hard, I'm starting today, but in quicker versions of it. And then I'll slowly dig them in deeper and deeper. Remember, I'm the guy that told my kids, your mom doesn't work here. Make your own slides. That's with <laughs> sixth graders. So it's that agility. And I realized a long time ago, again, last century, last millennium, that when you're talking about the state test, Josh, my motto is prepare to be unprepared. If I literally gave them that test every day for two weeks, they still wouldn't get 100%. They have to be ready to shuck and jive, to bob and weave, to add things and create on the fly. And you're not going to, oh, look, we're going first full circle now. When do you do that on bubble tests? Never. Never. So that stamina of solving problems and fixing things on the math side, because I've talked to ELA a lot. Um, Josh, there's nothing better than three act math problems to get ready for state tests. You know why? On the first part of the three act, we don't even give kids all the information. They have to figure out what's missing. When they get to that performance task on the state test, they will literally say things like this because kids are so precious. They'll say, this is just like a three act. Yeah, that's why we've been doing them since September, bro. So they got to, you know, you got to kind of inoculate them. If you ever had a crazy friend that would rub poison oak on himself when he was a kid so he would become immune. It's kind of like that. Like you just got to do it every day until it's, it's desensitizing them from those. And, uh, and, Mo, and since Moe said she likes the three-act, um, look up three-act, Google three-act math when math happens. Um, there's a lot of good ones. Dan Meyer is good. Uh, Kyle Pierce, his are good. But the best package for a teacher who wants to begin the process, oh my gosh, three-act math when math happens. And then here's the double win, you guys. If we do a three-act every Wednesday, I am 20% planned for the whole year. Right. And when am I going to grade them? I'm going to walk around and we're going to grade them right now. And so then now what am I grading tonight? Every Wednesday night, I can make my target run or my Costco run. I used to be grading. So that's that big switch. Immediate feedback, open ended. I'm not against bubble tests, but I think you need to know what they're for. Look at and GimKit are great for things like Latin roots, decimal conversion, fraction equivalence. Great, great. I am not going to ask you irony that way. That is not going to end well because you can guess and I don't want you to guess on irony. Well, you maximize efficiency in the eyes of the education world. So that's pretty cool when you stop and think about that. John, thanks yep. so much, man. Hey, you have any copies of your yeah. books on you right now? You want to show them to everybody out there? Ooh, let me see. Copy your desk? I bet you do. Well, I've got one for Moe. I want to send one to Moe. Get her, uh, get her email address or her mailing address. So here's one of them. And of course, the camera is going to screw it up. But here's one. So this is deploying edge of protocols. And this one is for administrators. Because the big problem that everybody has is they see a cool thing and they can't get their teachers to actually convert. And since I, we've been in football territory, just imagine a coach who loves the option. And you're like, but the run and gun's going to score more points. But this is what I know. It's the same with teachers. And then this one, here's book uh, two which has 12 edge of protocols in it. And um, you guys, we've sold like 40,000 of these. So somebody thinks they work besides me. That's and nice. um, it's pretty cool. I'm also going to pre-announce here the first time. We have a big event coming up December 17th. Uh, that is the Saturday that most teachers will get off for Christmas break. And uh, it's a free event for about, it's going to be about three hours of edge of protocols for free called... Edge of Protocols Worldwide, and this is number four. Last year, we had almost 2,000 people register. John, you made five minutes feel like, I mean, I mean, excuse me, 54 minutes feel like five minutes. That's what I'm going to say to you. I said that backwards there for a second. Unbelievable, man. Just like the last time you, you were on. Just great stuff. You bet. You Same bet. Well, my, like, like I said, my passion is, 
we do well, so much work and we're getting no results. We've got to change that. Well, you know what? I'm going to get more results when I see this show again. Because you know what? I've got to watch it a couple more times. And you know what? Thank you very much, John, for always being part of the show. You know, we'll, we'll tap on you some more, some more of that knowledge. Because you know what? You're an yeah. actual, actual practitioner of what you preach. So we thank you for that. But you know what? Who else is a practitioner? Guess who, Dean? The Red Zone is. The Red Zone this Thursday. At what time, Are we in the Red Zone? At what time? At 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock Thursday Are you night. Sure, Dean? I'm 100% sure. All I'm right. Sure 9 o'clock this, thir this Thursday. Oh. The Red Zone. We have the National Principal of the Year for the State of Texas joining us on nice. that day with some other guests. And next week, Dwight bring Carter. Mo on too. Mo bring, on, bring on Moe, too. You said oh, hey, here, right? I told Moe. Moe, reach out to me. We'll put you on Moe, the show. Moe, you got to drop, drop your uh, information in oh, a, yeah. um, DM. If you could do that for us, DM us at Unlock the Middle. Yeah, uh, your, and I got a book for you, Moe. Over to him. Drop so the hey, guys hey, your hey, mailing hey, address. I'll send you a free book. I was doing a Oh, yeah, sorry. Hey, man. Stop that, John. You already took it already for 54 minutes. And so join us on the Red Zone this Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, with awesome gifts, <laughs> with awesome information so that we all get stronger together. Thank you for starting us up today, John. Appreciate it. Cool breezes to you in California. Blessings to everybody, and have a great week, everybody across the United States. Be well, everybody. Thank you so much, John. Stay out for one moment. Remember, kids deserve your best every time you're in front of them. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>